I reckon. Yeah, I reckon. Yeah. <coughs> Good morning, everybody. My name's Kevin McConway. I'm one of the RSF as vice president. Um, I had uh, the great honour of introducing uh, Peter Diggle's uh, presidential address, the formal one, was carried out in the uh, time-honoured way uh, down at Herald Street in London. Um, when I introduced him there, I said, at least to uh, an academic statistical audience, and to most statistical audiences, Peter Diggle does not require an introduction. But then, because it's the tradition of these things, I gave him a long one anyway. <laughs> I don't intend to do that today, though, uh, because I know Peter wants to use as much of the time for this session uh, to communicate with you, to get feedback from you as is possible. Uh, so I, I, I want to take that second with saying a little bit about why this session is here. It's here partly because of an innovation for uh, this particular conference. It's here because there's a wider audience, a different audience at conference, and also the tradition, uh, as you know, if you've been to the President's uh, address, is that there is no discussion afterwards. There is uh, a vote of fact proposed and seconded by the immediate two uh, previous presidents, and that's it, the whole thing finishes. Um, so it's not very really interactive. Uh, so we thought there needs to be an opportunity for a wider discussion. People are very keen on that idea. Um, so I'll say no more. Our president will be here. Okay, yes, uh, um, just to follow on from what Kevin said, uh, the, the ordinary meetings are, of course, one of many very fine and arguably the finest tradition of the society. And, and I think our, our history of those ordinary meetings is the envy of many um, other societies. And it's primarily because of the full and frank discussion that's published in full in the journal. And uh, the, 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 I was slightly um, irreverently late last night um, suggesting we might have a quiz next year in which you have to identify quotations from uh, RSS discussion pieces uh, of whom was it said um, by R.A. Fisher that he wished the author had chosen a subject he understood better. Uh, <laughs> and since, since it was Naaman, he could probably manage to uh, survive that savaging by R.A. Fisher. Um, so I actually hope that there will be some way in which we can record the discussion. I mean, it, this may just not work. It may be a damn script, but, you know, I really would like people to feel able to, to come and make, you know, make a, 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 come to the front, talk to the audience, give us your views uh, in the way that we do at Earl Street. And so please do, in particular, give, give your name and affiliation uh, where, when you speak, because we are recording the whole thing. Now, whether we will be able to, how we'll be able to record it afterwards will depend to some extent on whether it's worth preserving, but that's up to you, not me. Okay. And so the other, the other corollary to what I've just said is that I'm not going to repeat the presidential address. I'm really just going to give a very um, brief overview of the more kind of broad policy-related issues that I talked about in June. And in particular, I'm not going to go into detail on the particular scientific uh, examples that I spent uh, most of my, my time on in, in June. It's, it's more to try to stimulate views from you on, on where you think our discipline is going and where you think our society should be going within that evolving process. <coughs> and it, so when you get to my age, you can kind of look back on the, and you have a sense of deja vu all over again, as, as somebody <laughs> once said, that, that when I started my career, statistical packages were just sort of emerging and there, and there was a, a feeling amongst quite a lot of people that this was a real threat to our continued existence. Um, because if a package could do an analysis of variance, why did you need a statistician? Um, and there are many reasons why I think uh, um, that threat proved not to be a threat, but indeed a fantastic opportunity for us to have more impact. One is that, that if, if something's impossible, you can fairly easily convince yourself you don't need it. And once scientists were able to do things with statistics because of the existence of packages, you know, rather than thinking, therefore, we don't need statisticians anymore, they could then actually see the potential of statistics to really impact more on their work. And so the rise of packages made non-statisticians more aware of the possibilities of statistics adding to their work, and also it allowed statisticians to do things more easily that they couldn't do uh, uh, before. And I think, you know, it's, it, it, seems, it just seems rather bizarre now in 2015 to worry about statistical packages making us redundant. Um, there was a threat 
in the 1970s, and the threat was what I've called the, the ubiquitous amateur statistician. I mean, we all know that the, the thing about statistics, which is in some sense both its strength and, it, and its weakness, is that anybody numerate can do a bit of it. And again, you know, if, if you really can't solve a differential equation, you can't solve it. Right? But if you can actually take some numbers and put them through a piece of software and get some more numbers and words out, there's a sense that you've done something. And, and, and it, the, the notion of, of when you do and do not need a statistician to be part of the problem-solving exercise is much more subtle than it is you know, uh, with mathematics. Uh, or you know, another example is when your car can't start. I mean, either you can mend cars or you can't. So we're still here uh, a long time later. And uh, um, one of the things I uh, said in June, which I'll say again, is that there's this famous quote from Rutherford, which comes up again and again and again. And, and it seems to me that uh, it, the, the weakness in the quote is the pronoun. Um, because it's not you should design a better experiment, it's somebody should. And of course, who's good at designing experiments? We are. And so that's one of my main themes, is that we really need to reiterate and, and re-emphasize the absolute centrality of design to our discipline. And, I, and that's something I'll come back to uh, in a couple of slides' time. OK, so <clears throat> doing what uh, you're not supposed to do and relying on Wikipedia for definitions. There have been several sessions at the conference this week on data science. And some of what I'm saying here, I've already heard um, from some people earlier this week in, in the earlier sessions. But it's, I think it's quite interesting to look at some of those words. Because in particular, what there are there are Wikipedia's definitions of data science, information science, and statistics. And I just want to make a couple of comments. Uh, the first is what I've written in blue, because to me, that's actually a rather good definition of statistics, not of data science, which is kind of interesting. And the second, I don't know if David Hand is, is here, but you may remember we had a discussion last November about whether statistics was a science or a technology. Yeah, and, and that, that definition of information science seems to me to be a definition that's all about technology, right? Whereas the, the other data science and statistics are more about science in the sense of trying to understand nature in its broadest, in its broadest sense. So uh, those definitions are saying are kind of interesting, but they don't quite, quite get it. If we're thinking that data science is, is not just today's fad, but it's here to stay, and I rather think it is, then a view that I held myself until about 12 months ago was that data science was essentially a synonym for statistics. And I was disabused of that by my uh, colleague Ian Buchan in Manchester, who heads one of the four um, centers for the, of the FAR Institute for Health Informatics. And he rather nicely summarized it by saying to me that um, statistics is about extracting knowledge from data in an efficient way. But informatics is about making the data accessible so that you can extract knowledge from it. And you need both. And so my, my attempt at a very simple definition of data science would be that it's statistics plus informatics. It's an oversimplification like anything of that kind must be. But I think if we're thinking about you know, data science as a, as a new thing that isn't just today's fad but is here to stay, what can we offer data science? And I, I think the, the, the thing that we really have got to hit hard on is, is that probability theory is the correct way to deal with uncertainty. You'll notice that my title had an indefinite article in it. Statistics is a data science for the 21st century. There are a lot of indefinite articles. That's one of the few definite. I, I actually feel, uh, and although most people know I'm not a, a convinced Bayesian in terms of how you do scientific inference. Uh, I, I have enormous admiration for the writings of Dennis Lindley, and one thing that I would be um, absolutely with him on is that that's the definite article. Um, probability theory is the correct way to deal with uncertainty. And it is interesting that, it, that we use it in two completely different ways. We use the same mathematical formalism uh, in both a deductive and an inductive sense. Okay? We use probability to build models, but we also use probability to express uncertainty in our conclusions. And then secondly, again, I said I'd come back to this, I think design matters. And design is, is often forgotten in the, in the world of big data. Okay? Nobody actually, and you can design observational studies. 
you, you know, people say, well, yeah, we can't design it because it's already out there. Well, you can design how you attack it, how you extract information from it, what you throw away and what you keep. And context matters. Again, if you're relying purely on algorithms, algorithms can't, don't know about context. And, and people do, and, and it's that human element of, of setting analysis in context that's important. But we have to recognize as well that, that there are people who know a lot more than we do about aspects of data science that are absolutely essential. And one thing that I think is long overdue in the world of statistics is the notion that a published article is not a complete solution to a practical problem. And reproducibility should be a minimum standard for everything that we do that's related to computationally driven research. And I think that, that our journals, it's high, high time that our journals should really buy into that in a big way and actually insist that when methodology is published uh, and results are given with the methodology, those results are reproducible in a computational sense. There are some very, very well documented cases arising in the omics world uh, where um, results that have been processed through algorithms and are not directly checkable have been substantively and disastrously wrong. Uh, and in particular, um, oh, I've got to mind, but isn't it Keith, uh, Keith Bagley, Keith Bagley in particular, has, has really been very, very active in pointing out that, you know, the omics technology is fantastic, the algorithms are very clever, but you can get rubbish out if uh, you don't appreciate the underlying frailty of the whole process. Uh, information technology has impacted on our discipline for a long time. Uh, many of you will have seen one of the famous photographs of Fisher working on his millionaire uh, calculator back in the 1940s. Uh, and in um, the 1940s, you might be surprised to know that CSIRO, the Australian Research Organization, had computers. You all thought that all started in Bletchley Park. Well, no, that CSIRO had computers a long time ago. But they weren't machines, they were people. They were women, invariably. And if you go, uh, actually you probably can't anymore, but until very recently you could go to the old CSIRO headquarters building in Adelaide and, and there was a library. Um, and the curious thing about this room is it had a door at each end. And I asked why there was a door at each end. And he said, well, at this end, your data come in. And at that end, your another table comes out. And between the two, there was a whole series of desks. And one person had the responsibility of calculating the means. The next one did the here. And you ended up with the, the p-value. So the, the, the lady at the end was the p-value lady. Yeah. And their job was called computer. Yeah. Uh, and they were invariably women. Um, I've already said the 1970s were the era of when packages uh, really became uh, widely available, but there were still some skeptics. And in fact, this is a, a quote from an RSS ordinary meeting uh, about the use of computers in teaching statistics. And I won't, um, he's long gone, but I won't reveal who said this. It was, it was not Evans. Evans was, was the author of the paper, and he was horrified when one of the discussants said that the way to understand multiple regression is to invert a 5 by 5 matrix using a desk calculator uh, rather than a computer package. We've had a little bit of a similar um, Echoes of that in some recent correspondence with an enraged fellow. Is Neil Sheldon with us? I think you know what I'm alluding to, Neil. Yes. Yeah. Uh, okay, so you don't, uh, you don't actually have to invert the matrix by hand to understand what uh, least squares regression is doing. Packages became languages, and that was, that was very important. And APL was, was a very early example of a, of, a, of a rather beautiful language that was well suited to writing statistical routines. And it, it suffered from uh, its own cleverness because at the time, um, the way you wrote programs was on a, on a typewriter, and there was a famous uh, make of type, model of typewriter, the IBM golf ball typewriter. And the golf ball was a thing about the size and shape of a golf ball, which had all the characters on it. And the idea was if you wanted to write in Persian, you had a different golf ball, you see. So you had a different golf ball for each string. And APL used Greek letters as, as primitives in the language. So you had to go down to the, the, the the room, and you had to take the standard golf ball out and put in your APL golf ball, and off you would go. So shift R was row, you know, and shift T was tau, and all that sort of stuff. And the whole program was written in, in this way, with Greek letters. And so the late John Nelder um, described APL as a write-only language, uh, <laughs> which uh, he wasn't very keen on it. Um, Bugs, I think, was, was uh, probably, uh, I mean, Bugs was a language before it was, uh, you know, specifically related to doing MCMC. 
and that was enormously influential and successful. And then S came along in the 80s, and anybody you know, who's a generation younger than me will say, you know, was there ever a world without R? Because it is now the ubiquitous platform uh, for what we do. And I mean, a phenomenal example of, of uh, pro bono work by statisticians for statisticians, the R project. I mean, if you think about the, the, the debt we owe to all the people um, who've put all that time into the R project to continue to do so, uh, uh, it's, it's open source, it's extendable, it's, it's essentially free, it's a, it's a wonderful, wonderful collective effort. Um, and where would we be without it? It's hard to imagine. Okay, now, um, getting a bit close to my own areas of interest, and this is echoing something, again, that David Hunt said earlier this week, that this is um, a timeline of the journal Biostatistics, which Scott Zeger and I started editing in 2000, and we edited for 10 years. And within that journal, we, it was the time when, you know, it was clear that a lot of omics technologies were coming up fairly quickly, and statisticians were just beginning to get interested in the omics technologies. And what I'm plotting here is the proportion of papers in each of the first 10 volumes that actually were overtly about genetics or genomics. In other words, I'm not just, these are not just papers about high-dimensional multivariate data. They're specifically about uh, genetics and omics. And you can see, you know, from 10% up to 35% in a 10-year frame. And what's happening here is that the technology came first and it was being used without statistics. And for a while, you were thinking, oh dear, these biologists are doing all this clever stuff, and they don't need us. And then we began to realize that they were doing the statistics rather badly. And so we could add value. And that's what we do as a discipline. You know, we, we don't often change the world, but we add value to it constantly. And, uh, and that uh, seems to me to be um, an important thing to remember when we look at um, concerns that some people have that data science is going to make us redundant. What it's going to do, I think, is it's going to have this honeymoon period when most people think it's all about computers. But then when you really want to optimally use the power of those computers to solve real-world problems, that's where our discipline comes back in again. And so we kind of sometimes come in a little bit after the technological breakthrough, and we then we, we have our methodological contributions to that. Now, I, I think there's, um, at the moment, we've got a very interesting situation in a field closely related to this, it's still life science but it's health informatics rather than bioinformatics. And roughly speaking, when people talk about omics, they're talking about very micro, they're talking about molecular scale problems. If you're talking about health informatics, you're talking about population level problems. But uh, you do get a similar situation, I think, where the, there's a lot of effort going into producing electronic processing of data, which doesn't exploit the potential to use inferential methods to extract information from it in a useful way. I mean, there are enormous amounts of data routinely recorded in, in, in healthcare, and we're only really beginning to appreciate that statistics has got a lot to offer as to how to make best use of those data. The NHS in particular has vast amounts of data that nobody ever looks at, because they don't quite know how to look at it, okay? And health informatics, sometimes called e-health research, is sort of the field that's uh, concerned with that. And the FAR Institute that I alluded to earlier um, with the quote from Ian Buchan is uh, an MRC-led um, initiative which has set up a network of four research centres around the country. It is still a country. I uh, don't know for how much longer. There's one in Scotland, there's one in Wales, there's one in uh, London, and there's one in the northwest in Manchester. Uh, and, and these are collectively looking at how to exploit electronic health data for the public good. Uh, and there are strong statistical challenges in that world. So uh, I, I'm not going to show you the examples I showed in June. I'm going to instead, if, if the internet works for me, show you a current project, which I'll just try. I just think it, it sort of um, illustrates the potential for statistics to add value. This is um, SavsNet is a, a small animal veterinary surveillance system which is up and running, um, based at the University of Liverpool. Uh, and uh, one of the buttons you can press if you go to this website is the real-time button. OK, well, that's not the most convincing demonstration in the world. That's always the case when you try to demonstrate it. But it, it, uh, the screen's pretty big. So th those are actually real uh, vets seeing real animals and doing stuff to them. Right? <laughs> and, and in every veterinary practice that's signed up to this system, 
that you know when they put in their clinical notes, the, there's there's a button they have to press. Species. There's another button they have to press. Syndrome. And then they can do what they like. But as long as they press those two buttons, it, it appears on the map. Okay. And uh, I didn't write the text underneath there, um, but I could have done uh, because what it says is, uh, I hope. Yes, there we are. Note that there'll be little live data, blah, 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 at weekends. To fully understand these changes in what's going on, it is essential to apply complicated statistical modeling. But you can see from the graph above that data is arriving in a manner that will allow this in the future. So, I mean, yet there's no inference on, in this system at all. It's a fantastic piece of software, uh, and, and vets are using it routinely and saying, oh, I wonder what's happening over in, you know, and you, and you can, I mean, I'm incompetent, but you know, you can zoom in and you can do lots of other things. But we can put inference on those things. And by adding an inferential layer to those things, we really do make them extraordinarily more useful. Uh, and I think that's, you know, that means we can see that. I, I mean, I certainly couldn't have built that software, but I think I can help to add a bit of value to it in terms of the information it gives. Uh, view. OK. Um, it's another point I made in, uh, in June. And again, it, it's actually echoing something John Nelda said. I, I think it was in RSS News and Notes in its paper days uh, that John Nelda said that mathematical statistics should really be called statistical mathematics. And I rather like that. I'm sorry it hasn't caught on, because I think as statisticians, we can and should be mathematicians collectively, not all of us individually. And we can and should be scientists. Again, not all of us, but you know, collectively we should be. But what's absolutely essential is to understand which one you're being at any given time. And it's a mistake, I think, to think they're the same. Because statistical mathematics is, roughly speaking, generic, whereas statistical science has to be context-dependent. And I think if we, if we lose that distinction, we're making the same mistake that I think some of the machine learning community makes in terms of they can do prediction because they can see patterns in numbers, but they can't do explanation because they don't have a context. And, and it's by working with scientists that we have the context. But we have to, I think, beware of a tendency, which again I do here, which is being overstrided into saying statistics is not mathematics. I don't mind people saying statistics is not just mathematics, but if we lose track of the mathematical roots of our discipline, we're going to end up with tools that are getting blunter and blunter as time goes by. So whilst we can and should champion the fact that statistics is not just mathematics, and we should champion it particularly loudly to EPSRC, if anybody's uh, yeah, listening, um, we should also be working together with our mathematical science colleagues to champion the importance of the mathematical sciences collectively to society, to UK, PLC, to anything you want. Uh, but I think it's very important in terms of how we teach our students and how we operate as professionals that we distinguish those two modalities. And that leads me on to the point about where should statisticians sit in an organization? I've spent most of my career in universities, so my, my apologies to the non-academic uh, community that, that I, apart from my time in Australia, I can't really speak for how non-academic organizations should deal with, with their statisticians. But in a university setting, if you'll forgive me that indulgence, um, should we be pushing for departments of statistics? should we actually be embedding ourselves within departments of mathematics? I think the trend in British universities over my career has been there was a brief flowering of departments of statistics springing up as the discipline grew, and then with rationalization and budget cuts and so on, they tended to be reabsorbed into mathematics departments. And if you are a small statistics group in a large mathematics department, life can be pretty depressing. All right? As long as you're a large statistics group in a small mathematics department, it's a great place to be, right? <laughs> and so what we really would like, of course, is, is to recognize that, that sometimes that's a good arrangement, but it has to be an even-handed one, that's my point. But the one I favor is, is more the spread around departments of XY. My ideal way of organizing statistics in university is to give every statistician a joint appointment between two, between two departments, between a, a statistics institute and a department. Now, X, in many cases, will be mathematics, and that's fine. In others, it might be biology, medicine, economics, engineering, whatever. And in order for that model to work, which is why it probably won't happen, you need dedicated time and space 
for the institute. And the institute can't be a virtual institute. It has to be a place where people physically meet and talk and drink uh, coffee and, and, and share ideas. And, and I've seen it working because it's exactly how CSIRO was operating when I was working there in the 1980s. Uh, as statisticians, we had a base in each city with maybe 10, 20 statisticians, each capital city of Australia, there aren't too many of them. Um, uh, but we also had offices in other scientific divisions. So I had an office in wildlife research. The person in the next statistics office to me would have an office in soil science. And we met every week to share ideas, but we went out to our divisions as well every week to get new ideas. And I think that's a, that was a wonderful model. Eventually it died, and I think it was simply because it was perceived to be expensive. And superficially it is expensive. But I think if you can really swing that, that's the way in which statistics can both preserve its own identity through X being mathematics, but also really impact on a university's work in the best possible way. I mean, I'm sure we've all had examples in our career of statisticians in our own institute, institution, beg its pardon, um, whom you never meet except when you come to an RSS conference 300 miles away. And that seems to me to be a shame. Now, a pragmatic alternative is, is, is um, I mean, statistics as a discipline is a benevolent parasite, right? That's a pretty good definition of what we are. And I think we should really, you know, invade data science institutes. Most, almost any university has got a data science institute of some form because it's, yeah, everybody wants one, you know. It's like vice chancellors always used to want medical schools, well, now they all want data science institutes, right? Um, but, you know, we, we really are going to be at the heart of these data science institutes, and we're going to be at the heart respecting that there are a lot of people in data science who know things a lot better than us about informatics, broadly speaking, but we've got a central role to add. So that's certainly uh, what I'm hoping uh, will the Data Science Institute at Lancaster will end up as. Um, it's made a good start by having two co-directors, one of whom is a computer scientist and one of whom is a statistician, Idris Equi, who may or may not still be here, but many of you will know him. Now, there we are in our organization. There's been an implicit focus so far on everything I've said on research, but what do we do about teaching the next generation? And I think it's time to radically redesign statistics curricula. I think we give far too many lectures and not enough projects. We have to build, we have to learn to spell, uh, but we then also have to build <laughs> on a solid mathematical foundation. And if, if I was able at a clean sheet now to design a master's syllabus in statistics, those would be the six topics. Design, probability and stock proc, likelihood, okay? Computation, and I don't just mean being able to run simple things in R, I mean understanding numerical methods and algorithms, and I mean coding, okay? Professional quality coding. Communication, statistics, as I say, is a benevolent parasite, and to be benevolent, you have to convince the host organism that you're actually helping them, and you have to communicate with them. And again, this was a point made in the data science session very eloquently, that, eloquently, that if you're trying to do statistics with non-specialists, one of the most important things is language and the ability to explain what you're doing in ways which don't uh, dissolve into jargon and uh, obscure, obscureness. And the final point is, is, now this is from my bias as a biostatistician, but I, I think it's a bit odd that, that we expect biology degrees to include a statistics course but we're quite happy to send out somebody called a biostatistician who knows nothing about biology. Right? And, of course, you, you, you can learn biology by working with, on projects. But I do think, one way or another, I think if you're trying to breed a new generation of statisticians who are data scientists, they should actually have an intellectual gra grasp of at least one major branch of science. And, and that should be formally part of their course. And one of the ways I would do this, remember I'm talking about postgraduate level here, is, I would actually um, have every statistics MSc dissertation be co-authored with an MSc student in another discipline. Right? And the two students would put the same dissertation in, but it'd be examined partly for its statistical content and partly for its scientific content. And, and that, of course, is then, because that's how scientists work. So if MSc courses are training the next generation of statistical scientists, why not train them in a way that scientists work? They talk to each other. They bring skills from different disciplines. Right? And I think, I think we could do that, and, and I think it would be a, a great step forward. There's nothing there on methods. I, I personally have never had a course on generalized linear models, or longitudinal data analysis, or non-parametric smoothing, or spatial statistics. Right? I, I hope I'm competent at most of those things, and I've learned it by doing it. And I think the projects is where you can and should learn methods. But if you basically, because it's by combining design, probability, and likelihood that we, you know, that's our principle, that's our gold standard. 
Okay, that's that's you know that's why we can say, yeah, okay, that method sounds sensible, but do you know it's optimal? It seems a bit ad hoc. You know, if you're grounded in good design, dealing properly with uncertainty and likelihood-based inference, you're pretty confident in 99 cases out of 100 that you're doing the best job you can. And what you need to make it a useful job is to embed it in somebody else's science. So that's uh, how I would like to. It's right. Now, how, how do we do that? Now, this, this again, I, I know at least one of my colleagues whose opinion I completely respect will disagree with me, but I think we, we teach statistics far too early. Um, in the set, we should teach it by stealth, of course, from the age of five, and, and I think increasingly we do. But in school, what, what I think is a really good, important development in England, I mean, the Scots, as usual, are way ahead of us. I mean, they've been doing this for years, um, is core mathematics as a, as a fundamental part of most students' uh, curricula. I mean, sorry, some of the English people may not realize, in Scotland, you don't do three A-levels, you do six highers. So, you know, you, you're doing mathematics to a considerably higher standard than GCSE, um, and most students are actually doing some. Uh, the English specialization on A-levels, I think, is, is really not good for statistics, because uh, it encourages a very narrow view, whereas statistics needs a breadth of view, because it's contextual. Uh, in BSc, I, I, if I was an educational dictator, I, I'd be tempted to ban all BSCs in statistics but insist that people do MSc in the statistics. And so, you know, you'd say, okay, you know, if, if, it was, if it was the Soviet Union of fond memory, then, you know, we'd say, right, well, you want to be a statistician? Right, you've got to do three years of hard maths, or three years of hard computer science, or, or both, and then you can be a statistician. Um, in reality, of course, I don't really believe what I'm saying, but, you know, it's, it's to make a point. And MSCs are where we really, you know, train statisticians. It's, I mean, it is more or less what happens in the US, of course. You know, I mean, you know, the, the great... Biostatistics departments of the US, Harvard, um, Johns Hopkins, Seattle, and so on, they take people into MSc courses who've got essentially little or no undergraduate statistics, and they produce great statisticians. PhDs, I think we need to really be more multidisciplinary, and following on my previous comment about MSc dissertations, I'd like to see team-based PhD projects. I'd like to see a team of students from several disciplines submitting a single thesis and it being uh, examined by a panel of experts in those respective disciplines. Now, postdocs, I think this is one of the most um, positive and encouraging aspects of the current funding environment in the UK. A lot of funding agencies want, they know they need more statisticians and they want to fund them. The MRC in particular funds many more statistics research fellows than does EPSRC for example. It wants them to be embedded in biomedical research, quite rightly, because that's its business. But it does a lot of funding. ESRC has put a lot of investment into statistics training at various levels. You know, again, it's either a good or a bad thing. I'm a, I'm a glass half full person, not even a glass totally full person. Um, so I think it's great that statistics is everybody's second priority, right? Because it means that you can actually get into all sorts of funding agencies and all sorts of collaborations. And although you know, people are going to say, well, actually, I'd rather have this fancy piece of kit or a machine that goes ping or something that produces genetic sequences every millisecond. But they all know that statistics is valuable and there are huge opportunities for us as a discipline to keep on putting that message in as we are doing in a society to people outside the traditional statistics orbit that statistics is relevant. And it's been made easy for us by the fact that statistics is no longer a nerdy discipline. You know, it's, there was... Um, I forget who it was, but one of the earlier speakers had this famous quote about statistics is going to be the sexiest profession of the 21st century. Now, whether that's literally true or not is not the point. The point is that statistics is no longer something completely esoteric. People are aware that it's core to a lot of um, what society needs to do. Okay, coming uh, close to, this, uh, to the society, um, I'd like to see our journals turn papers down in weeks, not months. I think the current traditional time scale for reviewing statistics papers is actually a hangover from its roots in mathematics, where the job of reviewers was essentially to police the correctness. You know, and essentially the reviewers were expected to prove the theorems as well and make sure they were... No, they didn't always do it, but I mean, that was the model, the implicit model. And, I, and, you know, I've, and I've sat in committees where, I've, where people have said, no, no, we don't want papers to be reviewed quickly, otherwise they'll be reviewed shabbily and shoddily. I, I think that's out of date for a lot of statistics. I think there's no excuse. I mean, if I take three months to review a paper, what I do is I, put it, I forget about it for two and a half months, right? So it doesn't really, um, you know, it just needs a different mindset. It doesn't actually generate more work. I'd like to see us publish a lot of short papers uh, and really aim to have papers that people other than ourselves can read. 
and recognize that all the detailed stuff, which is, it's essentially, it's got to be there because of my earlier reproducibility argument, that can and should be published electronically so that the very small number of people who have read the paper and really want to follow it up can find it. But, you know, if, if, I, if I had an issue of JRSS landing on my desk with 50 papers, each of which were two pages long, I'd read a lot more of them than I currently do. And I think we might think about that. And I think, you know, it's time that we should regard deposition of code and data as routine. There are obvious problems about um, confidentiality of data in some cases, I understand that, but the principle is that as a minimum standard of reproducibility, when you publish a paper, code and data should be there for other people to say, yeah, I got that number as well, or not. Uh, and I like, the, the BMJ is very good at this. You know, once a paper's published, people can put online comments on it. And I think that's something that we ought to be able to do in, in all of our journals, because statistics, fundamentally, is, is a subject you can discuss. It's partly why we never do well in maths funding committees, because slightly, slightly um, parodying, if you go to a, a mathematical sciences funding committee and there's a proposal in some branch of algebraic topology, then the one person who understands it will say that this is the best in its field. Right? And if a statistics paper comes in, every statistician in the room says, I wouldn't quite do it this way. <laughs> and surprisingly, the stats grant doesn't get funded. Right? <laughs> Leonard Silver made this point many years ago. So, yeah. Um, now, th th this isn't me, this is the society. I'm just relaying to you what in many ways the society is already doing and was certainly doing before I um, uh, got more involved with it again. Um, th th this has been a, a theme running through several sessions in the conference and one we're pursuing very vigorously. There's, there's a real tension between public good and individual confidentiality with data. And I very much liked uh, the bioethical point that Scott Zeger made on day one, that if you have benefited in your medical treatment from people before you happily giving their data to actually advance medical knowledge, that you could argue that it's unethical for you to withhold your data so that future people can't benefit from that same thing. It's quite a nice argument, and uh, we'll see if Jeremy buys it, uh, if he doesn't cancel on us at the end of the month. Uh, um, yeah, uh, I think informatics department, great. The more informatics, the better. Uh, what we've got to do is be in there with them uh, rather than moaning because they're just pinching our, our place in the academic pantheon. And I think sometimes we are a bit too precious about terminology. In a sense, I don't mind whether people call themselves statisticians, informaticians, or data scientists, as long as what they're doing is statistics. And, and then the, the, final, the final comment is, is one that, it, this is a personal comment, but it, it, it really amazed me. The first time I went to Africa to do um, some research work, I, I was just completely amazed by the, how deep the penetration is of internet and mobile phone technology in the poorest quarters of Africa. And there are, there are serious um, positive implications for how you could transform information and access to healthcare in poor countries. Uh, and so I think this, this high-tech world that we're now in isn't just about rich countries and making money on Wall Street. It's also about empowering poor communities in some of the poorest uh, corners of the world. Okay, well, I'm, I'm hoping that we now have the rest of the session devoted to you guys. And please say, do give your name and affiliation, and if we can make a worthwhile record of it, we will, and we'll disseminate it in an appropriate way. And the, the mics are coming around. We have a couple of time left in the session. Um, if people want to come down here, that's fine. But as Peter said, can you be sure to speak into the microphone, and give your affiliation, and give your name, uh, so that you know what you're saying. Uh, thank you, Peter, for an, for an excellent and very inspiring affiliation, uh, affiliation uh, talk. I'm Jane Hutton from the University of Warwick. Um, I really like your description of the educational program, and I agree that the MRC and the EP ESRC have been great on funding statistics. I wasn't able to go to the EPSRC meeting, but EPSRC withdrew funding for MSCs as an, e as an entry-level qualification many years ago, and I wonder how we can convince the government that if they want to plan, if they're happy to plan for the number of vets and doctors, they might usefully plan for the number of statisticians and recognize that MSCs and statistics, um, we need people coming through and we need to work out how to fund it. We are going to do this Errol Street style. I'm not going to respond uh, yet. <laughs> Uh, 
Um, so I've been to a couple talks now where we talk about, you, oh, sorry, name and affiliation. Um, my name is Kristen Gray, and I'm with the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine doing a PhD funded by the ESRC. Yes, yeah, uh, very happy about that. Um, but with data science, the, the list grows ever longer of the things that need to be a part of that. Now, I, I fully agree that they all need to be part of future statisticians, and, and particularly that programming needs to be taught, not just at a rudimentary level, but how to program well. Um, and coming from an American background, I, I wonder if there's any thoughts towards making degree programs longer to fit in all of this new information. A any talk about, like, is one year enough? Takes about 10 seconds of total. Right, okay. Stephen Sen, Luxembourg Institute of Health. Um, a very interesting lecture, Peter. I want to pick you up on one particular thing, which is the role of mathematics. And I agree that um, every statistician should, in fact, wish that they knew more about mathematics. And so I think that one can't disagree that a, a fundamental training in mathematics, which is something I've always regretted I didn't get, um, is an important thing to have. Nevertheless, I think also it's important that statisticians should understand they're not mathematicians. And George Box said that statisticians have the chance to become first-class scientists, but prefer to be second-class mathematicians. And it seems to me the attitude is fundamentally different. In mathematics, you start with your axioms and you prove what follows, but statisticians have to engage with the real world. And it's not enough to say that if these assumptions hold, that in that case, um, these conclusions are, are valid. You have to actually make a difference to uh, what practicing scientists do. And one particular example is the fractured field of design. We have wonderful design theory, a lot of which is, in fact, looking for an application. And we have uh, lots of poorly applied designs, which, in fact, could benefit from the theory. And I think this is partly because uh, we have failed to bridge the gap between what statisticians really should be doing and what the mathematical theory enables them to do. Uh, Nick Galway, GlaxoSmithKline. Um, about the issue of where statisticians should be located, it applies in the corporate world as well as academic institutions. In my organization, we've done it both ways, and my personal opinion is it's much better when you are in a department of statisticians because obviously what you learn from each other, the, 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 the fizz that you get from other statisticians, but also because um, so often on a you, on a team that is enthusiastic about something, you are the voice of caution and gloom and maybe the exciting explanation is wrong and the boring, there is another boring explanation that people haven't thought of and you have more confidence to be that voice of gloom if you have a, a base outside the team that you're embedded in. Uh, Peter, I just, that's um, Ian Hunt from the University of Lille. Uh, I wonder if you uh, think it's time for a new logo for the Royal Statistical Society and what you think of the old wheat chief and the original aims and goals of the society, whatever they debatably are, and the new logo which says data, evidence, decisions. Um, it seems to miss the spirit of teamwork and the limited role that we, we can play in evidence and providing evidence and making decisions. I, Maybe benevolent parasite is probably not marketable. But. <laughs> I'm Robert Elston, uh, retired from Case Western Reserve University. And I want to reiterate two things that have been said. Uh, you know, I also wish I'd had a degree in mathematics. Most people who get into statistics start off with a degree in mathematics. That's all very well, but I think we should train more people whose main degree was not in mathematics, psychology, physiology, myself, zoology, and, and, and things like that. And then, because that way, in a way, you know, the mathematics, you can teach yourself, but you can't get the lab experience yourself. That's much more difficult. If you haven't had that originally, I think it's much more difficult to get it later. So I'm glad that I did not get a degree in mathematics, not because I didn't learn mathematics, but because I had that practical experience in the lab. 
And I want to reiterate that. And also, I do believe that people like myself who become statisticians should be in a department of statistics, as the last speaker said. Okay. Hi. Um, I, I like, uh, this is Chris Wilde, University of Auckland. I like most of your talk, um, but uh, the thing I would like to take issue with is the educational model. Um, this is a model that's, that's aimed at optimizing PhDs in statistics, and I think that's a tiny, skinny little tail trying to wag a date great day. Um, I think in the, in the modern world, um, skills in turning data into helping you understand the world better are absolutely core for everybody should be integrated from the very beginning of school. It should be a broad, wide society effort. And uh, so it should be infused everywhere. And the concentration shouldn't be just on how do we produce you know, a few of the really best mathematical sciences going. Uh, Murray, Murray Aitken, University of Melbourne. Uh, Peter's comment about where, what's the location? What's the optimal location? I've, I've been in, in many different kinds of locations. I worked in an ag school, an engineering school, um, two mathematical science schools, and I had a joint appointment, the only one I had uh, at an Australian university in statistics and psychology. And, and that was the only joint appointment they ever had at that university, and they're never going to have another one. Uh, because it worked out very badly and in fact I asked to be withdrawn from a joint appointment <coughs> to have a single appointment in psychology, uh, which I did and then I left. So uh, th there's no simple answer to this question. I, I agree that the ideal arrangements, the CSIRO arrangement, which of course I know about, uh, what was superb at the time and the fact that it t terminated is an administrative matter and, and, and a very bad scientific one, but I don't know what the optimum is really. Thank you very much. Um, I'm Kresh Niro from the University of Lagos, Nigeria. I um, must say that this seems to be the most impactful I've been able to listen to so far. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, well, you mentioned Africa, and I know that there are quite a number um, um, impactful developments coming up in statistics, especially in my university. I've been privileged to be there for 20 years practicing statistics. Um, my concern is that we have a department of mathematics. We have a bias under the department for statistics. Some statisticians in the department are eager to have um, statistics come off from the mathematics department and stand alone. But that's not really materialized over these years. But I just want us to say that RSS, ASA, I've been privileged to also be at the ASA conference, but I just wonder that it is possible that this structural, um, this curriculum structure can be introduced to these departments so that the content is developed in line to be sure that they're developing great statisticians such that they are not totally just looking at, you mentioned cut and paste, which seems to be what I see is going on. So if RSS can suggest to the department, this is what statisticians should um, um, be um, um, made to go through before they graduate and become statisticians. I think it will go a long way to help us. Thank you. Um, Deborah Ashby, Imperial College. Thank you very much, Peter, both for your presidential address and for the reprise today. Um, a lot of what you're talking about has been the training of statisticians, but there's a parallel debate going on about how we skill up medics, biologists for this world. And certainly I keep being invited along to all sorts of sort of meetings with the great and the good to solve these problems. And they're often quite muddled, at least I find them muddled, because somebody's talking about how people can understand statistics. Someone else is talking about whether people to empower them to do statistics. And I'm beginning to wonder, and I haven't thought it through thoroughly, but I thought I'd raise it here, whether we should think about developing something equivalent to the common framework for languages. So anybody who speaks a European language may know that you can grade yourself by 
what your level is at reading, what your level is at speaking, and there's criteria that you can either ask some simple directions or you can have a, maintain a conversation or you can understand any fluent native speaker. And somebody may be quite good at that, but actually quite bad at the writing, for example. And I'm wondering whether we would have something like that, that both medics, biologists could start to do, but also you'd expect most statisticians to be pretty fluent in all of those. But that might begin to solve it, because otherwise it's we kind of there's sort of them and us about it. either you're from a mathematics background and you're not really a statistician and I'm parroting slightly I'm mathematically trained or you've come from somewhere else and it's just so how we do the spectrum mm. but something equivalent to common language framework I think would actually clarify quite a lot of these other debates and when I've raised it it's it's had some resonance so it might be something the society might begin to get its head around before other people take it over Thank you. Uh, it's David Hand, Imperial College. Congratulations, Peter. That was really tremendous. I must say I've rarely heard such good sense. And I, I don't mean I've rarely heard you talk such good sense. <laughs> I, I mean I've rarely heard anybody talk such good sense. Um, but I was a bit um, perturbed. Your list of topics started with design. Now, to me, desi design is just a half of the sort of things we do. You didn't refer to observational data and administrative data and you know, a lot, of the top, a lot of the sessions at this meeting have been really talking about those things. So I'd like you to, to comment on that gap, if you like. And, and just another little comment. Somebody asked about the strapline data evidence decision that the RSS now use. When we came up with that, we did for a while toy with the potential strapline data understanding decision, but decided that the acronym didn't help much. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, Gordon Hunter, Kingston University. I wholeheartedly agree that we should fight to keep mathematical and statistical rigour within data science, but I think we might have a tough fight because the um, trend in a lot of universities, both at undergraduate and master's level, in computer science, in informatics, in information systems, whatever they want to call it, is to cut mathematics out of it. They think the students find maths too hard, too boring. They, they, don't, they think it'll put students off. It will have a tough fight to keep mathematics. They'll want to do data science because it's sexy. They'll want to run courses in it. They won't necessarily want to have a high mathematical or statistical content in it. I'm, a, I'm sad to say that, but I think we've got a tough fight there. Thank you. Um, um, thank you for the opportunity. Um, I'm Ping Ping Ni, and I'm from Mitsubishi Tenabe Farmer Europe in London. I said it very slowly because I want everybody to know that Mitsubishi is not only making cars, it's also making drugs. <laughs> but is, by now it's separate to different companies. Um, what I would like to say is that I'm a minority in this room, as I realized. Uh, I'm from industry and I feel very close to the academic community because of once I wanted to be a professor myself. <laughs> uh, but I followed the path of first trained as a mathematician and then I spent five years to, uh, to do uh, computer science and the neural networks and later on became a statistician. So I fell uh, very close to all the different disciplines. Um, what I'd like to emphasize is that it's very nice for statisticians uh, sitting together and talking about statistics, how important it is. But when you go on to the outside world, especially when you're working in the interdiscipline area, like myself in medical research area, you would realize that all those decision makers, all those people are making important allocation of resources are not statisticians. And the human mind, brain, do not work scientifically as we are here based on evidence. Uh, human brains, for example, if i talking about what's the best education path for statisticians, because I have that specific path, therefore I more prefer to people who share my training experience. And similarly, if you're talking about 
in the real world where the physicians traditionally have been dominant in that area, then they prefer the people from their disciplinary to make decisions. Therefore, they are the one eventually have decision-making rights. And statisticians are not. Therefore, I would like to, for this community, to promote not only the statistics as a science or mathematics, no matter how you define it, it doesn't really matter, but as person, as leaders, to the higher position, please. Thank you very much. I'm Fiona Underwood, I'm a statistical consultant and I'm also in the International Development Working Group. Um, I liked your last point about data science in the developing world um, and what you say there is very true but talking with a number of um, NGOs, one of their concerns is actually the really vulnerable populations don't have access and the concern is that these populations will be omitted um, from, from a lot of things if, when, with a lot of data science work. And I think there's actually a real opportunity and challenge there for statisticians to help think about how you can sample and include the vulnerable populations um, in, in whatever it is they're trying to do. And at the moment, I'd say there's not many statisticians working in this area, but a lot of economists. So it's not just data scientists we're kind of, we need to work with, but economists as well have, um, yeah, anyway. Uh, um, yeah, thanks. I, I, I enjoyed that tremendously and agree with so much of it that I, I struggle to find any, anything interesting to say. Oh yeah, thank you. John Whitaker, GlaxoSmithKline. Um, but I just wanted to emphasize a couple of things. One is I was delighted to see your emphasis on design and on sort of science in training of statisticians because when we recruit things, people, I think that the two things that are most often missing are an understanding of the principles of design and not detailed scientific knowledge in a field, but scientific understanding and appreciation of the way scientists work. So I thought that was great. The other thing I wanted to say is that certainly at GSK and anywhere else I've ever worked, most statistics is not done by statisticians, it's done by scientists. So I think two things are important. One is continued provision of tools that enable them to do the right thing rather than the wrong thing. And some changes to the way that we train, we teach statistics to non-statisticians because I think we teach too much technical detail, too much formula, how to do a t-test, etc., etc., rather than the, the generic principles which enables them to know when they're doing the right thing or not. So. I'm afraid that I have to close this to an end because there is a timetable. I want Peter to have the chance to say a few more things and we have to drink coffee very soon. So, <laughs> uh, my uh, previous head of department, Toby Lewis, who at the end of a Lord's meeting discussion, if there were people who wanted to speak, would say, let's carry on anyway. I'm not saying that, I'm inviting people to do that. Okay, thanks. Um, and thank you for all those responses. I, I, I will reflect on whether we can actually maybe set up some sort of forum in which we can pursue some of these issues. I won't attempt, I mean, this is the other tradition, of course. You see, what I know, now, now do is say, that was all very interesting. I'll, I'll reply in the journal in due course. Which, uh, but I don't have that recourse now. But I would just like, because it's, it's been a recurring theme, is to pick up this education thing. I, it's my fault for being, for, for lack of clarity. I, I would absolutely refute Chris Wilde's charge that I'm being elitist and training PhD students in this thing. Um, I, it was the way I said it that, that, that um, got it wrong. That's a lot less esoteric than most current statistics degrees. Communication, science, computing things. And I firmly believe that even the most applied statisticians were much better served by understanding stochastic processes, probability and likelihood theory than by learning 20 different methods. And so that was the point I was really trying to make. And I, I absolutely um, accept that for society at large, we want statistical thinking to be embedded from early childhood right through. I, I subscribe to the H.G. Wells view that uh, statistical thinking will one day be as necessary for efficient citizenship as the ability to read and write. And that was, uh, that was more than 100 years ago. <laughs>
pretty far-sighted. Um, but it, yeah, like all of these things, it's, it's, there are nuances here that I, couldn't, I didn't capture in the presentation, which I apologize. I hope the written version, which will be in JRSSA, is more nuanced than that. And I absolutely accept that from the perspective of society, um, the very different issues about statistical literacy which are more important societally than producing the next generation of statistical scientists. But, but I was thinking very much of, of how I would want to train a future statistical scientist, whether they're working for GSK or a university or, or whatever. Um, so I mean, and we, if, if we do get a chance to follow this up more formally, I will try and put that in a more, in a more nuanced and, and balanced way. Um, in terms of teaching non-statisticians, again, now that's one thing I'm unrepentant about. I, I absolutely agree with John Whittaker that I think service courses in statistics also teach far too many techniques and not enough basic principles of thinking. And you can do that without requiring advanced mathematics. And uh, as my ultimate indulgence for this conference, I'd commend a book by Chet Lyndon Diggle, which attempts to teach introductory statistics to non-statisticians in a way that minimizes technique and tries to get across general thinking about design inference what it's all about. Um, but I'm really grateful uh, for the responses and as I say, I, I, we'll, we'll start by getting some sort of looking at the audio and if we can follow this up in a, in a way that's useful, we will do. If, if you've got any thoughts on whether you'd like to have a, a more formal discussion forum for the presidential address, g given the age we live in and, and the web facilities we've got, we can do that. So please let somebody at HQ know if you think that's a good idea and we'll, we'll talk to Jack about setting it up maybe. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.